<clears throat> I'll try to speak loudly to stay where and let us know, of course, in Hackendy if the microphone needs adjustment. So in this short talk, it's just the 15 minutes to get you motivated and get you maybe not even just motivated, but also to kind of understand the physical pictures, not just the conceptual picture of scientific computing. So, well, I mean, what is scientific computing? I don't know, do we, do we need to define it? Uh, some definition would be, you know, to the, the fact of using computers. So recently, the, what's the word, data science came as a, you know, uh, term that is very famous. I like this um, XKCD cartoon where they're saying, um, you know, is this, this is your machine learning system. Well, yeah, of course, you put the data into this big pile of linear algebra and then collect the answer on the other side. And if the answers are wrong, you just clear the file. So often, I mean, I'm not saying that this is what we do and what we see, but you know, it, it is a bit messy. It, it has always been a bit messy, but I would say that things are getting you know, better and better. But I think the issue with the mess is that sometimes we miss the bigger picture, including kind of the physical picture where the different bits of the system are. So if we think of a, some sort of a conceptual flow chart of what could be data science or what could be you know, computing or what, what could be even the scientific process or at least in, in academia, you know, there is some data that might come from an experiment or from simulation. And then there's some models, some hypotheses that you might wanna test that might come from the literature or you are, you know, exploring the data. And then there's the processing. So the process box that you see there is really, you know, getting the data, picking models, testing statistics, you know, every field has different approaches, but more or less conceptually, we all agree that this is, this is the way it goes. And then at the end, there are derivatives. So outputs that could be pre-processed file, result maps, and whatever statistic, and then papers and posters, you know, and this is what you're supposed to do if you work in academia, if you work in science, and then, and then repeat the loop. But what is missing often, maybe because it's never taught, maybe it's just always assumed that you heard it in high school, or maybe you heard it in when you're primary school, maybe you heard it at kindergarten. What is the computing happening? What is, what's inside you know, the laptop or the, or the computer where you are? So most likely somewhere in your past, in your years, in your learning years, you heard about terms like CPU, RAM, and whatever, SSD, hard drive. But in general, just to remind what these things are, so the CPU is the, like the central processing unit is where the actual com computing happens. So the, the fact that some data is most likely stored in the RAM in the memory or read from the disk SSD, or maybe from a remote disk, from a remote um, storage system gets gets analyzed, gets, you know, maybe some numbers are summed or multiplied or whatever is, you know, the operations that we need to do. And then on top of these physical things that you, you really have under your hands now, if you are typing on a laptop, there's the operating system that is managing all these physical resources. And on top of that, there's the applications that you might be using, MATLAB, R, Python with Spider or Python, whatever. And then there's the user at the end. So here in this, to, to be kind of for the sake of completeness, we also added, you know, options like containers, which are like a virtualization layer so that you can uh, kind of, you know, include the full operating system with the full software so that it's, um, you know, that I can give you my container so you're sure that you can do that, the same thing. But without, you know, if this is somewhat clear of what's happening in your laptop or in your computer where you're sitting right now, even in your phone actually or in your iPad more or less, it's actually the same. What is less clear sometimes is the bigger picture. When we move away from the tiny laptop, the tiny, you know, phone or tablet, because our computer needs are growing. So then, you know, working it's of course you could invest in buying a bigger laptop a bigger machine with more cpu more RAM, more storage but at some point things just just don't scale it's just impossible to, to do this so then comes this type of map this type of physical map of the resources 
it's somewhat physical, it's somewhat conceptual, but it's it's basically present in all universities or companies. Or um, Enrico, there was yes. a request in the chat that can you increase the microphone volume? It's it's a full volume. I can try to. Yeah, maybe Zoom longer. is yeah making yeah adapting. I have to fix my microphone. It's it's picking up the laptop microphone. So yeah. Uh, during the break, I will switch to another microphone. But basically, what we're trying to tell you here in the first 10 minutes short talk is that it's important that you understand the physical map of the computing resources, where the data are stored, and where the computing is happening. So, if you remember the previous pictures from the local machine, from the local disk where you are. It's clear that everything is in there. You don't maybe need to be connected to the internet to load the data around some analysis. In practice, though, many, many of these systems today, they still request some code from the internet or some libraries from the internet. So it's very difficult to work completely separated from the internet. But then your computing needs are growing. The RAM is not enough. The CPU is not enough. And they start using some remote systems. So, in general, in our organizations, like at Alto, CSC, or many others, there are different types of storage systems. You might have some um, system that allow to store lots of amount of data, but you can understand that the bigger and the slower the, the system, the more data might be, you know. And when, when the data starts to grow and grow and grow, the accessing, the reading of the data, the loading of the data might become my starts to be slow. And then you need to start thinking, where do you want your computing to happen? So maybe you have a workstation at your department, and then from home, from your laptop, you connect to your workstation through remote desktop, and you do your stuff there, because that's enough for you to have a little bit more powerful computer. Or maybe you don't have a workstation at your desktop, but you can use some of those services. Some of you most likely are familiar with Jupyter Notebooks. So there are websites, Alto, for example, has the uh, Jupyter Triton service that um, you can basically request, again, a node, which is like a computer that for you will run a Jupyter notebook that through the internet you can interact with and run your scripts and load the data. Or then, you know, the notebook might not be enough. Notebooks themselves are not the most efficient way. The remote machine that you have in your, in your office, maybe that's also not enough. So then you might really want to move your data science workflow onto an HPC cluster. So later we will talk about parallelization and after HPC is, is connected to parallelization. But I don't think we even need parallelization because if you if all you need to do is manage big data, it doesn't it doesn't really make sense that you slowly copy all this large data set on some external disk on your laptop and then try to work with that and then re-upload everything to the remote system. It's, it's you know, why, why don't you just move your code to the remote system, get one of the nodes that you see here, these little boxes from the cluster and do what you need to do, analyze the data, produce result, and then what you need to move back to your laptop at the end is maybe the figure, the final figure that you want to include in your report. So in general, I think it's important to understand this picture and uh, maybe see more, you know, we want to say, we want to tell what do we, what do I write here when I say <laughs> HPC login node, why the login node will be very important on day two and three. Yes. So, so usually uh, in this kind of like high performance uh, computing systems, you need to have some sort of like a way of accessing the resources. So, because like the resources are usually shared among multiple users, like because like what Enrico was saying, like this kind of like a situation where where when you have a laptop, that's your laptop. When you have a desktop, that's probably your desktop. But but when the, uh, the resources grow in size, they also grow in cost. So of course, they become shared resources at some point because no single research group or single researcher can anymore afford to pay hundreds of thousands to, to millions of euros to to and get a get a computing uh, cluster for themselves so they have to be shared among a university or even uh, like multiple uh, like in case of let's say lumi multiple uh, countries 
uh, and multiple universities in multiple countries. So they become shared systems. And in order to have a shared system, you usually need to have some sort of like a access point to that. If you consider like uh, a cloud infrastructures like Azure Cloud or uh, Amazon Cloud or whatever, they have they have their own web pages where you can do launch stuff in there. Uh, in in HPC clusters, there's usually a login node where you log into the system, and from there you can then uh, submit your jobs into this kind of a queue system that we'll be talking later on, so that you can get your share of the resources. But basically, because everything is shared, you need to uh, like work in the system. You cannot work in in there like um, like completely without. Uh, without knowing how the system works because the hardware limitations cause like uh, how, how they how it's set up cause uh, cause it to be uh, have have some sort of like a, a system of behavior inside of it and how, how you're supposed to work with the system in order to get ma uh, most of the resources into your like in order to access most of the resources if you notice in the picture here, I put this sign, which is if you have a driving license, it's basically you're not supposed to even stop there. You know, not not just parking your car, but even stopping with your car. And the idea is this: that often people think, okay, now I got the account activated for some HPC cluster, CSC, or driving account, and uh, you just log into the system with whatever, let's say, with the terminal. And you just fire up your TensorFlow or multi CPU Python. Well, what happens is that the process, the computing, as we were saying earlier, is going to happen in this machine. So, on the hardware of this machine, but if this machine is accessed by hundreds of people who better try to access the little nodes, the, the other machines there, you're actually going to stop the work of everyone. So, the login node is a node where, in practice, you don't actually analyze anything. You don't even, you know, use. You go there, you stay there just to check, you know, or just to get access to a dedicated node, or just to see how your non-interactive processes are, are going. So you can understand already here that we are talking about different types of flavors, different type of workflows that one can have. Some people might be happy to have the kind of local workflow that, uh, you know, the kind of scientific method the scientific process that I showed earlier can all happen in a single machine because you have small data and you just have a you know you're happy with the laptop or with the desktop that they gave you at your at your office and that's about it. But then often you, you start to mix your <coughs> workflow. Maybe during the development stage you need to have some sort of interactive workflow because you need to debug, you need to plot some of the data. But then when you have really lots of data you you, you don't want to run something interactive that stays there for a month just to run whatever learning machine learning process. So then you want to submit the jobs, that, as you know, was saying, the minute that you have a script, where well, it doesn't need your attention anymore, and you just tell the system, this is the script, we will load some data, we do some stuff with the data, and we will save some output. The system will take it, will assign it to resource, you can go have a walk, enjoy the summer, and when the script is over, you you can look at your results. Yeah, in, in, in general, like, uh, because like there's this kind of like a natural law that not everything doesn't scale up. It, like you cannot um, make a machine, like usually if you make a machine twice as big, you get uh, twice as many problems usually. So, so you have to like split the machine up uh, usually to have multiple machines instead of like having one big machine because then it's a single point of failure and you don't want that. So, so whenever stuff scales up, it becomes more distributed. It becomes more distributed, but in order to manage this, this like that everything is distributed, uh, their tools and and those tools are like the queue system in the HPC systems and stuff like that. But uh, in the end, everything runs somewhere. Like everything, like sci scientific computing, this in the end it, it returns to like some application runs somewhere and uses some CPU and some memory and maybe a GPU and stuff like that. Some somewhere somewhere uh, stuff is eventually being done. Like somebody's going to do the stuff. But the question is like, how do you manage it? And and this is the question that you cannot simply reduce scientific computing usually that you do everything on your laptop 
you you can in ma- some cases but in many cases you just you you just run out of laptops basically <laughs> like you can buy another laptop and then, and then try to work with two laptops but at some point you just have a have a problem that you cannot uh, it doesn't scale anymore and then you need to like use systems that uh, like the HPC systems that allow you to 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 do this scaling but it like enrico said it's important to recognize what what are you currently doing is this the part of the job that actually requires the risk resources or not and then like figure out which parts are good to do in a laptop and which parts are good to do in a cluster because then it's uh, it makes uh, everything easier for you yeah and basically this was some sort of motivational introduction that you understand the hardware not just the hardware that you have under your fingers right now but also the remote hardware and when do you need more of computing or RAM or storage or whatever of course it's a learn by doing process at the beginning you might request too many resources or too little but then you will optimize and Mm. understand just as a like a quick example many people are often surprised that let's say the cpus in the computing cluster they they don't have lots of gigahertz like people talk about gigahertz all the time when they talk about cpus like something is three gigahertz something is so as a turbo frequency or whatever and and that's like a like a speed that that tells the speed of the system but that's not how it goes when you scale stuff up like for example even if you have the most like fast laptop do you want to run it constantly 24 hours in your own apartment running like <laughs> sun hot in your lap, like uh, constantly running there in the background and calculating some stuff? No, uh, you want the stuff to be run in a compute cluster where it's in some server room, it's causing noise there, but you don't have to listen to it. You just like some server does it energy efficiently. Like it's also a matter of energy efficiency that like many of these systems, they might not be, they, they might have some some of these complications that you didn't think about, but they are there for a reason because at some point scaling uh, needs to happen and that happens by doing these kinds of like uh, optimizations. All right, our time is up. The web page you got the link on the on our learning materials. It's also on the Hacking D. It has a nice collection of uh, list of services for doing this, you know, you, you don't need to be at Alto or SQ University or CSC. There's many services that can get you started immediately with quantity. And of course, if these free services, free, you know, brackets or any apostrophe are not enough for you, you might have, you know, services from your institution. So if not from Alto, I recommend checking with the, the link that we provide with this description of this and different strategies.